My father started working as a chain striker when he was 14 year old. That was in 1910. From the look on him later, he must have been thin and weedy, but he was going to work hard. One morning, a 14 pound armor was put in his hand and that would be the tool of his trade for the rest of his life. He'd make millions of blows that would make chains and shackles that would go to war, save ships and lives and go to every port and ocean in the world. His armoring was as good as a machine. He used to say he'd never eat another striker's armor at the fire. We're looking at a length of chain and it's just iron. To follow how it's made or listen to a chain maker talk about it, it almost feels like it's alive. The only machine further used was a shearing machine to cut the inch and five eight bars used to make the chain. All the tools, apart from his armour, he made with his own arms. Some sin chain making is just metal bashing, but you think about some of the skills they had to use. They could look at hot piece of iron and know when it was ready to bend, and when it was hot enough to weld. Too hot or too cold and it was no good to know when a piece of iron was bumped up enough to make the eye of a shackle, and to be able to make the tools needed to make the chain, shackles, swivels, rings or anchors, or any other things made from the fire. The fire had to be able to go up to 1400 degrees. You'll think about a pair of tongues made from two lengths of iron that are heated up, fustest bumped up to make a lump where the pivots goes, then that lump's flattened and later on all spunched in to put the rivet through. Tongues had to be made for every bar side and for every other job they needed for. To make a link of chain, a cut length of bar was put in the fire and heated in the middle. Then that would be bent into a wide V-shape. Then it with armour till it closed to a U-shape. The irons put back in the fire and heated up to about 1200 degrees. Then laid on the anvil and one end scarfed or flattened with the pointed end of the omen. Then flipped over and the other end scarfed. Then back to the fire to get to weld and eat. What ends when then bent on the anvil point to make it look like a link. More eat and it was omen to make the weld. When it was welded it was put on the beacon. Beak iron you'd call it. The dolly was brought over to make the giant look finished. Inch and five eight chain, what my father made, needed a chain maker and two strikers. The strikers followed one another, eating the dolly, while the chain maker moved the link about. To watch two strikers eating the dolly, while the maker moved the link, was poetry in motion. Sometimes a stud would be put into the link to make the chain stronger and stop it collapsing under strain. A length of chain was 22 yards long. A new link had then be made to the U-shape and threaded through the first link and finished. So the chain kept growing. Every time a new link was added, the weight the chain maker had to move about got more. So they had very strong arms. The factory where my father worked had seven halves. A brick shed with two walls with big windows and two open sides open to the weather and that was reported in the papers as a progressive factory. Father wore obnail boots, woolen trousers, a leather belt and a flannel vest. Wool was best because it day set on fire. A leather appen, apron you'd call it. The appen protected the legs a little bit. The face and arms had no protection. They were always getting sparks in the eyes, they just kept on working. The most important thing to a chain worker was his sweat cloth. It's hanging up or round his neck. Feather's arms always amazed me. His palms and fingers were made up of thick pads of callous skin, eighth of an inch thick. When he opened his hand, you could see all on them. When his hand was closed, they made a solid pad that fitted Domersdale. It was a trademark he'd earned in time and sweat. Feather come home from work one day with blood on his hand. Iron Sprinter had gone in, and he took the kitchen fork the one used to hold the Sunday joint and dug the splinter out. It was as thick as a pencil and half inch long. Well worth a visit to A&E today. Nowadays, health and safety folks would have a field day. In the winter of 1947, it snowed in early February and for six weeks a day go above freezing. The open side of the chain shop faced northwest and feathers back catch the wind from Dudley. His front faced that iron and the fire. It was surprising that he had lumbago and pneumonia. 
Here's a story. Woman in her middle seventies told me that when I was a little wench, living across the road from the chain shop, her mother had gear her a little bag with egg, a piece of bacon, and two slices of bread in it. Father put the bacon on the end of the shovel and fried it, and then fried the egg, tossed it, and this went on the bread, and it was great. A perfect breakfast for a little kid. I said, I can still remember the taste of them pieces, even after 70 years. Was this another skill of the trade?